Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Jeremy, and for the opportunity, Chris, for being able to speak at this Unlocking Nature Forum. Um, yeah, it's uh, the title of my talk um, tonight is, is Bad Talks Inside Story, uh, Rare Insights into the Biology and Behavior of an Endangered Species in South Africa. And um, as Jeremy said, actually, Jeremy um, and Petri were the, uh, hatched this project. It was their idea. I, was, I happened to be in the conversation, but it was actually their idea to um, put a camera up on a, on a very seldom seen bird, uh, a bat hawk, which has been, which has been um, uh, nesting or present in Wide River over the last couple of years. And um, I think Roy Sarkin was one of the first people to to uh, to find to find them, and they've been moving over various different sites. I think Ricky Potts Garden there was one, and I, I've only been in White River for a couple of years, but um, these are real sort of uh, White River symbols of of bird life. So as Jerry said, this talk is dedicated to Petri. Like Petri for you, and he's a, he was a technical driver of this project, a, a passionate conservationist, and. Um, it's very really nice to see the Zana in the crowd, and I hope Karina is listening as well. So, um, so this the, the structure of my talk tonight. I'm just going to give a brief introduction, the aims and objectives, um, installation of battle cam, uh, insights into the battle adaptations, uh, battle feeding behavior, the the breeding behavior. Uh, some unexpected challenges where, where that happened um, during the course of monitoring them. And um, if there's time at the end, there's raptor conservation in general, because uh, bat hawks, bat hawks is actually what they, what they call one of the low felt specials. And it's quite a, it's a rare bird that, that uh, is present in the low felt, but because of their uh, behavior and their, you know, they're, 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 they're seldom seen, but they're a nice um, introduction into raptor conservation in general, um, at the end, I'll, I'll give a, a brief explanation about what, what I'm meaning there. So, so this is the bird. That's the this is the enigmatic bat hawk. Um, if a, a, lot, a lot of you might have seen this bird before, it's this um, this raptor, which is uh, got these bright yellow eyes and with a white streak above and below the eyes, and it's it's got this um, you know this this mottled brown uh, plumage with uh, with a, it's got a, a black streak down the brown and white throat, uh, unbarred tail, and they're really enigmatic because they they occur often in foresty areas like in riparian felt next to rivers, and um, they got this amazing adaptation of hunting bats. So um, I'll describe just later. We've been getting some really interesting insights about their feeding behavior, and um, they've got these their blue and white feet. They've got this elongated claw, this middle claw, and I'll show you just now, is, is, um, which they use to hook bats. They go on these feeding binges, and they eat bats at dawn and dusk for about uh, 20 minutes at a time. And they just go rampant. They, 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 they indulge in these bats. So we've been getting some interesting um, information. So this is, uh, so they, they're crepuscular, um, and this is our bird that we're going to be talking about uh, tonight. So just in terms of the aims and objectives, just briefly, we wanted to monitor the nesting behavior and breeding cycle of a pair of bat hawks in Wide River uh, to better understand their distribution, life history, feeding, and breeding behavior, uh, to contribute towards a population and habitat viability assessment and biodiversity monitoring plan. So we wanted to just get the scientific research angle, but in general, we wanted to just improve the awareness of, of bat hawks and raptor conservation in, in general. So this is the, um, the distribution. So yeah, I've got this laser here, which is useful to, to show so, um, point, point where the slides are. So, so um, we here obviously in White River, they've actually got quite a cosmopolitan distribution. I, they, they're endangered in South Africa, but they occur throughout the world actually. They occur in, uh, well not throughout the world, but the, the subspecies that we get here occurs in Africa, Central Africa, West Africa. Rod was saying he saw one tonight. So where's the Republic of Congo, Cameroon, and Central Africa Republic? I'm not quite sure. I'd get very lost there. I've been to, to the Republic of Congo once, but I'd get very lost there. 
So, um, but I think we can know our way around so that the low salt in South Africa, just to say that um, they also, there's another subspecies that occurs in, in Indonesia and Malaysia, and also in Papua New Guinea, the Eastern, Eastern New Guinea. So um, it's quite a quite a interesting how this bird has managed how it diverged into different uh, subspecies at very different points in time. So it's got a must be a very interesting evolutionary history of, of, of the of the bird. It's quite a unique bird, in fact, because it's not related. It's like a falcon, but it's actually related only to the, the kites and, and hawks. Quite a distance relation. It's actually in a monotypic genus. So it's a very unique species. So this is. Um, in South Africa, they're endangered. They estimate there's only 75 to 100 um, birds in, in South Africa. Um, and uh, they occur, this is generally in South Africa, in Southern Africa. And then on the right is a map from the Red Data Book for South Africa. And we hear White River. And they occur in the Lothar, they occur up at the Furi on the Levuvu Limpopo River. Um, I've seen them in Makuleke there. They occur at Shinguetsi River, Taba River sometimes, but very sparsely. And they, they, they occur in Zanin, which is um, where another study, a study quite a while back, um, which I'll talk about, they've been, they've been studying the nesting behavior. So our, our, our project here makes a nice comparison with the Zanin study. And the population in White River um, is probably the same as the Crocodile River ones. I, I think the, the, the birds they see at Marloth Park and um, Malilan, they could be uh, the same birds we get in White River, or, or probably not the same birds, but uh, close relatives. I mean, they've got very big home ranges of up to 400 square kilometers. So it wouldn't be the same birds, but there is a population, a nice population on the Crocodile River. And, the, and there's been two or three pairs in White River over the years, uh, Swaziland and Northern Natal, but very sparsely. So that's, that's a distribution of, this is from the South African um, Bird Atlas Project, uh, which the Red Data Book, Bird Life South Africa. Okay, so then, um, okay, just to put everybody in the picture here, to get, to get our bird's eye view, we had to install the, this battle cab. So this was a big challenge. So, so this diagram shows how we went about it and how we finally achieved what we wanted to do. So the idea was, we this is a eucalyptus tree and the nest is up here. So we wanted to get a camera up here to, to, to monitor these birds. And the only way to do that was to program it with a computer. And I just have to mention the A team here because I was a, I'm a bit of a novice here because uh, Peter's, Peter's a computer fundi. Uh, Garth has got a lot of experience monitoring the, the, the crown eagles using a similar system. Uh, Petri was a, a technical driver, a real fundi on the technology. And, and Jeremy was there as support. So um, we managed to get this, uh, we had to get power to the control box. The computer was in there. I'll show just now the computer uh, was programmed to, to, to uh, monitor, to uh, work and uh, operate this camera. And then we had to get it to a virtual cloud server so that we could finally look at our laptop and get the, the images uh, uh, downloaded. So it was obviously easier said than done, but in the process, this is, we were at step by step. So this was the, the, the neighbor, I think his name is Wimpy and Nell. He, he, he lent a hand by letting us use his uh, electronic gate to, to access the 220 volts. And when we, we, we put a, a trench under the road and laid the cable to the control box. So there we go, that was the power supply. We got the cable there. And then we got into this control box here. Here's a control box with, with all the technology. That, that's a picture of Petri setting it up. Um, and um, this was a very important part of the project because this, this, this control box contained the, the actual computer. This, this is actually the Raspberry Pi computer. Uh, Peter would be able to explain much better than me, but I've got a, an amateur perspective of it where we managed to it's got a motion detector, which was programmed by this Python program, which um, operated the, the camera. And then it, um, it was a motion detector, CCTV camera with, uh, and the control box had a modem for the internet connection and it, it uploads the images to the cloud server. So that was the power that needed to power the, 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 the camera. So now that was control box now, 
Um, I hope it's clear there, but uh, this is now getting the caving, so we had to get up to the nest. And this was probably the biggest challenge. So, um, Rachel, when there's a will, there's a way, because we had to do it in different spurts. So this was a cherry picker to secure the control box onto the tree, mainly just for security reasons, because we didn't want it to be vandalized. Um, but then we, the first platform we put up, but this wasn't high enough. This was a, another a crane that we went, we put a, a platform up, but the birds, we didn't think the birds were going to use this because they, they're very, very specialized in, in their nest. And so we knew that they were nesting a bit higher up. So finally, we actually got up 26 meters, which was quite a feat. I don't know if you can see the, the, the industrial crane. We managed to, to hire a crane, low fold crane higher and, and, and uh, I was actually went up with, with Petri and myself and we were, we were cabling it up and, and we had to go up and down this train that was quite a perilous, uh, I didn't take out any public insurance liabilities, so just as well I'm here to talk about it. So um, it was quite fun. So here we go. So we got up to the, um, to the nest and then we finally got into, um, up to the nest. Um, and um, luckily we didn't climb the tree. Um, we, we were thinking about it, but uh, we, John Davies from EWT very sensibly said, and, and Garth, we do, that these trees are quite fickle. So, so what John and, 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 and them do at EWT is they climb up nests to monitor Warburg's eagles and stuff. And, and they often climb these trees and um, uh, they harness themselves up and put a pulley up and climb them. But I think it would have been a bit perilous to do that. So these cranes helped. And then so finally we managed to get up to the uh, the nest. So so there we go. So battle cam was launched. This was the, the, the camera. So and and it's and and it was operational. So this was the scene is set. Here was the um, the nest. This is where we got up to. And this is a nest. It's a stick platform. Nothing too impressive. It's just an inverted basin. Um, and they bird the birds breed mainly August to January, mostly September to November. So now. It's actually a very good time because this was last year, but the birds have started to breed again. And um, there's promising signs that they're going to manage to, to be successful this time. I'll explain what happened last year, um, why they didn't uh, brew the chick, but th that was another story I'll, I'll explain. That was quite quite interesting. And often these birds, the bat hawks, but they choose these eucalyptus trees because they, they like, they've got light bark. And because the bat hawks are crepuscular and they're nocturnal as well, to navigate at night and to, to actually find the nesting tree that, that it, it helps having the eucalyptus. And Jeremy was saying they also they nest in sycamore fig trees as well and other light barks because, uh, and funny enough, they'd, they'd be more common along with sycamores along riparian felt. So, so these ones are, I suppose the crocodile rivers in Elspeth, but this, this um, the eucalyptus trees they've, they've taken to and uh, they were using this tree. So immediately we started getting they took to the tree, they're really brave birds. They, they managed to tolerate the noise of, of lawnmowers in the town and, and dogs barking and, and they were totally oblivious to this cam the camera. So within possibly less than half an hour, that these birds were back on the nest. So uh, we, were, we were very nervous that they were gonna desert and that we were disturbing them, but they really didn't mind whatsoever and they came back to the nest. So this is the game's beginning. We managed to start monitoring them. I'm just looking here, ideally, uh, one could put a, I'm just thinking aloud now, but one could put a, a tracking device on a harness on the back of this bird because they don't actually know the dispersal movements of the juveniles, but you don't want to disturb them. So this is just an idea, possibly if they brood successfully, we could actually monitor them and um, biolog them, wildlife track them, but that would be a, another feat, but that could be an ambition in the future. But we were very careful to be very, um, non-obtrusive, so we don't, we, the, the study in Zanin, they managed to catch a bird and ring it, but we haven't managed, to, we, we, we're keeping our distance now. So, so we immediately started getting pictures of these, these birds. And for example, here, the bird was, this is the fires right up to the camera. They were even perching on this virtual camera, this um, CCD camera. Here you can see the, one of the birds with bright yellow eyes and, and, and you can see the feet as actually, you can sort of see the long elongated toe there. Look, here's the, this is the actual toe of the, this is the toe they use to hook the bats, which is a unique adaptation. They've got this bright yellow eye and uh, using his tail as a rudder here. So this was, so the game has begun. This was great. So, so then we started getting some really nice um, insights into adaptations um, of these bat hawks. 
So this is the different section of the talk. So, so here we got the birds. This is a nice shot we got of the birds flying, one of the, the pair of the bird. And you can really see it nicely how, so with birds flight, I mean, you, it's, it's quite, I'm not, a, um, I'm not a pilot at all, but you know, basically the principles of flight, you've got, you know, you've got lift, you've got weight, you've got thrust and you've got drag. And these bat hawks have managed to master this. They've got these long, uh, either these long pointed wings that which, which, which um, allow them to be maneuverable and they have, that, that maximizes the lift. And they've got these strong uh, muscles in their wings which allow them to have thrust. And then they use their tail as a rudder to like, you know, use a drag and then, um, and they weigh almost nothing. They weigh 600 grams. And so they're very, very maneuverable, 600, 650 grams. So this was a, so this is, we got to, we started getting to know these birds. And this is a nice example. Um, Terry, Terry Puppers, I hope he's listening in the audience, but he, he's a very strong supporter of this project. And Terry runs, uh, invented and runs a light aircraft, fixed wing aircraft company, which they use in anti-poaching all over Africa. They use them in the African parks, uses them for anti rhino anti-poaching in Chad and, and all over Africa. And he actually was inspired by the Bathawk and uses the, used the Bathawk as, as their logo in, the, in his uh, company. And you can see here the, the Bathawk, it's quite an inspiration. So this is an example of biomimicry. You know, biomimicry is learning you know, asking that what, what we can learn about nature and what nature can teach us about ourselves. So that's you know, a long, also a nice theme, unlocking nature. Or, you know, we, we, it's, an, it's a overlapping with a lot of our interest tonight about why, we, why we're here and why we like learning more about nature. So the, the, this was a great example of biomimicry. Um, here there's, to take it even further, I mean, look at the, the, these, 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 these long pointed wings of, these, of this bird, I mean, this posture. And I mean, poetic license, this is like an F-16 Falcon. I mean, this is a, a real uh, machines, the, the way they, they, they uh, manage to, you know, dominate the skies in the bird world. So, so that's a nice biomimicry app. So here, just an example, just as I was explaining, the, they've got falcon-like wings. They've got these slim, unslotted wings, which promote fast, efficient flight in open habitat. They look like a big falcon, actually. And um, just as just an aside of just out of interest, bird flight, you've got other birds like albatrosses and these long, narrow wings, which they glide. Sometimes they, 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 albatrosses can actually navigate without even flapping their wings, and they can go in miles and miles. I'm sure Peter Ryan will be able to tell that much better than I can. And then you've got things like grass, you know, which, which have got short rounded wings with fast takeoffs and rapid maneuvers. And you've got um, beautier hawks, for example, which migratory hawks and, and eagles have these type of wings, which have got more sort of wing tips, which, which they have like a, which reduces drag. And that's also inspiration for way also airplanes. I mean, you know, airplanes have got wing tips at the end of their feathers, and that's also an idea of biomimicry. So they've actually got slots in the wings, um, which increases lift and gliding. And so they, 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 they glide the thermals, whereas the falcons and these bat hawks are in the open, maneuverable, fast, and they want to outmaneuver their prey, which is bats. And so just here, I just got this, um, the owl, and this is quite interesting, is that the ulna, which is the same, for example, as our from our elbow to our wrist joint, would be the analogy here. They the ulna is actually 20 centimeters longer than Lanner's and Peregrine. So they've got these really long wings, which um which, which is this bone here. And the yeah, battle's 124 millimeters, Lanner's 99, Peregrine's up 86 to 98. So they're actually like a real super falcon, these these battles. I mean, we know, I mean, peregrines and lanners are the most one of the most efficient birds. Uh, feeders, I mean, hunters, and, and the bat hawks right up there with the paw. So that was just super falcon, I said there. And then, yeah, so this was just, I, I just superimposed here. Here's an example of what this nest, what this bat hawk would look if you put him through an x ray. <laughs> You'd see what that would be his owner over there. So, so they're real, you know, they're real super predators. And then we started getting other just interesting um, insights into the adaptations. I mean, we got them preening, all birds preen. And preening, what they do is that there's a preen gland, which birds use, all birds do it. And they, um, they, they use a preen, like an oily substance with cleans of feathers and removes parasites. And um, it zips up these warm barbules. Um, 
and often you'll see birds pr uh, preening and um, they, it's, this is a, it's from this uropigial gland that the birds and they dip their, 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 their um, beaks into it and they, 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 they run these oils. I'm sure you the birders in the audience will, will know this and it was nice to get the bat hawks actually preening. We got them fluffing up their feathers uh, as well, like cooling off um, in the heat of the day. It got really hot last summer. I mean, in the low fall, we get to high 30s, 40s. So these birds are exposed on this nest in the open. Uh, they're exposed to the wind. Look at, you can see the wind blustering through there with the eucalyptus trees. And so they're really resilient. Um, and uh, here's a, the pair. So they're really, uh, the, that, uh, they're really, really resilient uh, birds. So, um, so that's, so, so what we've got, so what are the, so here I was talking about sensors. This is a real bird's eye view because this is what actually the bat hawks, this is thought how the bat hawks view the world because this is the, the, the camera that, that Peter uh, used, that we ordered was, was it's, it's an infrared, it's got an infrared function. So it allow, allows us to see at night. So that was a key for this whole project is because these bats are, are nocturnal. So this is just a, a graphic I brought up, which is, um, we did this from our, our, our bird book. We, 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 we used um, an idea about how birds' eyes differ from mammals' eyes. And the first thing to notice, well, actually the point to illustrate here really is why their eyes reflect at night. And they, they reflect here because they've got this tapetum lucidum. So the reason at night game drives, you know, the cats, the leopards and, and bush babies and genets, they shine, they've got this tapetum lucidum. So night jars and, and bat hawks have this, have this layer. And that's the reason we, the, the, the lights bouncing off from the flash of the camera. They've also got tubular eyes. These binocular vision, these raptors have, have tubular eyes. Whereas here, this is a human eye. And here we've got the fovea and we've got far more cones and rods in our eyes. We can see in color. So if a bat hawk, they've got far more rods than cones. So they've got, I think, a million, we've got 200,000 cells in the, in the phobia, they've got a million, so they can see five times better than us at least. And they've got binocular vision, so, so this is, so they really got really good eyesight. And, and here you can actually see how it was captured, the infrared camera captured this reflection. It's like, um, you know, there's like Luke Skywalker, but you know, this is a low shutter speed, but you can see this is the eye reflecting. So that, that, that's from this, uh, the Tepetum lucidum. Okay, and then, um, so that's it, that's the bird eye view, um, and that just gives an idea about, you can see these lights in the background, it's a town of Wide River, how those lights are reflecting, and it's almost as bright as a battle's eye. So now we went, what was really interesting to get, they really specialized bat hunters, and as I was saying, they go off and they, they leave the nest and they go foraging. They got huge home ranges, but these birds were probably forage, forage fairly close to the nest, they were using the nesting tree and um, they, 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 they go out in the open and then they, they um, this is a great shot that Stuart Mellenton took of the bat hawks. You can actually see it's got a bat prey here. That's a free-tailed bat, a molossid. So th these bats, they've got this elongated middle claw which hooks the prey. They swallow the prey in flight and they actually go on these feeding binges. They go like at um, 8, 18, 20 minutes, they catch as many seven, seven bat hawks and they, and they swallow them in six seconds flat. So they're really unique among any raptor to do that. So um, in order to, um, in order to uh, understand what they're eating, uh, just interestingly, bat hawks like owls, not, most raptors don't have this, most raptors, raptors just excrete their prey. Bat hawks uh, regurgitate pellets um, and uh, one can work out what they're eating by collecting these pellets underneath the tree. We did this. Um, and we worked out, well, this is, we didn't, uh, I mean, Robert's seven uh, worked out, you know, there's a, bird research has often got lots of, you know, there's lots of people who are contributing to the knowledge base. And, and basically this describes the bats that they took and, um, you know, from free Angola free tail bats to, these are all insectivorous bats, microteropterans, serotonin bats, house bats, slit face bats, Jeffrey's horseshoe bats. These are all these insectivorous bats. And they also take um, birds like swifts, you know, palm swifts often flying around at the same time, swallows, martins, down to starlings, which is quite a feat. They're quite, you know, quite big birds. And then also canaries, bishops and wax balls. And, and you can tell that from the feathers. So that, for example, would be a swift. That was a swift feathers. 
And they even got emerald cuckoo. And the emerald cuckoo was similar habitat. So the Batalks is a record from Roberts of an emerald cuckoo being taken. Um, and then you might want to tell that by looking at the feathers. And then also insects. You can see the exoskeletons in some of these um, uh, scats uh, in the pellets. So you get beetles, dragonflies, damselflies. This is bat fur. And that's uh, bat bones. So that, that was quite interesting. And it could make for a nice study if a student wants to carry on doing that, just collecting the pellets. Okay, this, this is quite interesting just to look at. This was the study they actually did in Zanin with Tony Harris and them 20 years ago. So I think, um, and this just shows you how active they were. And it shows you when, which hours of the day they, 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 they hunt. So it was four, four in the morning, between four and five in the morning. and six and seven at night in the evening. They did almost their, all, all the um, their, their feeding binges. The rest of the day, they during the heat of the day, they don't hunt and they hunt a bit at night and a bit in the early hours of the morning, which was interesting. And this, what was interesting here, this is also from Harris's paper there, but what is interesting here, as you can see four in the morning, they, they had 58 feeding binges, seven in the evening, they had 42 compared to very few otherwise. But look, what was here, they even correlated with, with the light, with the phases of the moon. So in the dark phase, there was actually, they were more successful in catching bats than the dark phase and the light phase, both at four in the morning and at seven. So it's counterintuitive. You'd think that the bat hawks can see better at the full moon. But I looked it up in a, this was a paper I found on the internet about activity levels of bats and um, catydids in relation to lunar cycles. and. And what happens is, uh, would, the main reason for it was lunophobia. So the, what happens here is that the actual moths are lunophobic. They only, they only come out during the dark phase of the moon. So because there's so many catydids out in the dark phase, the bats come out. And because the bats come out, the bat talks come out. So um, I've got your animals are exposed to many conflicting ecological pressures. And the effect of one may obscure that of the other. So a good example is lunophobia, reduced activity of bats in full moon. And the main reason for it was thought to be that the bats adjust their activity to avoid predation, but the bats can be prey, many are carnivorous themselves, so they're going for the catydids. So that was, I found that quite interesting about that. So, so it's a full moon now, so they won't be, so they won't be hunting as much. And what's interesting here, also another thing about the bats is that this was interesting just to get some insights about the bats themselves. So as I'm sure most of you know, the, the, the bats use echolocation to locate their prey, and they basically send out sonar pulses, and then it bounces off their prey, and it comes back, and then they've got these specialized structures in the noses, which registers in their brains where the distance is. They're blind. I mean, they can hardly see. So they use what they call a Doppler effect, which compensates for high frequency, low frequency, and they work out what the distance is. And the Doppler effect is like similar to when like a car on the highway, you can only hear like a you can only hear it after it leaves. So that's that's the kind of how the bats are navigating it. So they're, they're, they're working out the distance from the frequency of their sonar and the response through this Doppler effect. And what's interesting here was that um, we did this at Varsity actually at WITS. We, we, um, well, say we did, we were interested in it. Uh, we tried to catch a few bats in mist nets. And, and the, the free tail bats are actually very different to the these these other horseshoe bats. The fetal bats, which are the ones, this one, which hunt in the open, they have lower frequency and longer wavelengths. And this is because they hunt in the open. And what they've done is they've evolved narrower wings. And so the wing morphology has evolved in tandem with the echolocation strategy, which is interesting. Where over here, you've got these other horseshoe bats They've got higher frequency echolocations, but shorter wavelengths. And the reason for that is that they're bouncing off that, they, they're foraging close to the trees and the leaves. And they're going for the catydids, whereas these things are probably going out for flies and other insects that are out in the open. And so the, the reason I'm pointing this out is because the bat talks themselves, they, they, they hunt in the open. So their wing profile is similar to the fetal bats, which are their prey. So they mainly, in the open, they're mainly going for these molosses, these free tail bats, and um, they both have narrow and pointed wings. So that's an adaptation for hunting in the open. And the point here is that there's this evolutionary arms race going on here, which is quite interesting. So you've got these, the bats going for these, the bats are too, worried, too busy trying to get these catages and worrying about the bat hawks. So they're honing in this echolocation. And what's really fascinating here is even these crickets, these catages, they, they use ultrasonic themselves 
to jam the frequency of the bats to avoid predation. So that what happening is they, they give a pulse, an ultrasound pulse, which, which jams the frequency and it gives the, the insects a split second chance of escaping the bat. So you've got this real food chain here. You've got the bat hawks going for the bats, the bats going for the catheters. And, um, and that's talking about the wing shape profile of the two different types of bat families. So this, they call it in evolutionary biology, they, they call it evolutionary arms race. So similar, similar, similar to how cheetahs uh, uh, go for impalas and the reason impalas stopped a similar kind of thing but that's another story so and then uh, we're, we're, another thing about the bats we were thinking about looking at um in effective insecticides so many students are out there this could be an interesting project because there's a lot of macadamia nuts at plantations in white river so maybe the insecticides are affecting the the, bat, the insects and maybe that's affecting the bats which might be affecting the battles but so now well, let me just slow down a bit <laughs> so yeah, we started, that was the feeding. So now we started getting insights into their breeding. And we even got them, this was last September. We started seeing them displaying, they, they, they started displaying that this is uh, both of them with the wings open. Um, and uh, this is probably the male displaying to the female. And this is interesting is that they even other birds do it as well. They, they call them natural gifts. A male gives a female a gift in order to entice it to breed. So certain birds, the, the classic example would be bower birds. I mean, that's an example of how they really decorate their nests. But bat hawks, they feed each other um, bats as, uh, as as gifts. So actually, the, the male brings a female. So I think we're capturing this at night. We, we, we I actually want to ask Peter to, we, if we hone in at four at, at, at seven o'clock at night and, and at four o'clock in the morning, we're going to get more of this. We're going to see what they're going to do with their bat prey, and so that could be interesting. And then the nuptial gift worked here because the, the female managed to they woo them, the male woo the female. They, they mated. They even got the mating with the, with the bat hawk cam, and then. And then she put, she, I'm sure they fertilized the female because they started even lining the nest with, um, with fresh eucalyptus trees. So what was interesting here is that um, talking about bird biology, um, I, I looked up on the internet the reason why, what, what, what causes this um, instinct to incubate. And it's, it's due to the secretion of a hormone called prolactin from the pituitary gland. And um, it, 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 prolactin is mainly uh, mammals, but birds also have this. And so what is interesting here, I, just, I found this on the internet, is that the pituitary gland is actually next to the pineal gland. And in Greek mythology, there's a hieroglyphics, which is the eye of Horus, which is the falcon of Horus. And it's based on the shape of the pituitary gland and the pineal gland, and it's called the inner bird. It looks like the bird, the third eye, the inner eye. I wanted to tell Mark Mills that in, in, in Egypt, he could maybe there's some bat hooks where they are. That's, he's in Egypt at the moment. But that was, um, I found that quite interesting. So, so that was uh, how bat hooks, just as a side, got us some insights into, into um, Greek mythology. And then so, um, so they laid an egg last season. It's, they, they have a white egg like this. This is from Warwick Tubberton's book on, on birds' nests and eggs. There's actually a great, there's a great, there's a great sketch of a bat hook. Uh, nest in that book as well and I, they po they're possibly white because they high up and they're nocturnal so they're not going to really they don't need to be that camouflaged um and then here there's a female sitting on the egg and then the male the male goes out hunting so this is a fantastic shot that that, that the battle cam captured and um yeah the male looks like it's going on out, out on a mission and this is from tony harris's and then paper again the male actually brings in twice as much as a female. So here, you can see here this graph, the male, uh, the male is in the, the, those black dots and the female is a square. You can see there's much more, three bats, four bats, three, two or three bats, but the bat hawks are catching more prey. And they, and they also correlated here with the light phase and the full phase of the moon. And, um, but the, 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 so the male was bringing out more, feet, the males in the Italian were bringing out more Bats, but they were actually sharing the incubation um, duties. So this is a bit obscure. Let me just minimize this. I can just see here. Here, so here were they incubating. They were sharing the incubation duties. Here, the female and the male, 52 days. A uh, 52% female, 48% male. 
similar hours, um, mean daily incubation, 11.2 hours in the female, 10.5. So they were sharing incubation duties with the male and the female. But, but when the chick was hatched in the Janine study, then the female did most of the brooding. The female's brooding here, um, you know, 81% uh, of the time. And the male, the male, they're 19%. So they, they, they actually, so they studied this in detail and said, we, we will be able to do the, if they have a chick, if our, if our their talks have a chick and we, we program the camera, we'll, we'll start getting data like this, which will be interesting. And then, um, so the unexpected challenges, we had, uh, first of all, a lightning strike, which was captured here on the battle cam. And um, we speculated that might have spooked the birds off and then flooded the nest. And that could have been the reason the chick didn't hatch last season which was unfortunate. So we had to go back and fix up the, the control box. So, um, so we, we, we managed to do that with Peter's help and um, at, at guidance on that. So we, uh, the other unexpected guest was this uninvited guest. We downloaded the photos one day and this Egyptian geese appeared on this camera. And the, the, the Egyptian geese are opportunistic um, breeders. So they were checking out the nest and wondering why maybe they'll They'll, have, they'll breach uh, and they even chase this battle away. You can see the battle there in, in red there. They, so they, they, they were a menace. Um, so we wanted to shoot them, but uh, I don't think we need to. It's quite an easy shot, look. But um, we, 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 they, they went away on their own volition. While, while the hawks are away, the geese will play. So that was quite fun. And then, yeah, God captured this image. This is fabulous. This is, uh, so they, they came back. So they're back on the nest. We're downloading the data. They're still there, and um, yeah. So this is that's basically the bulk of it. So these are that's the enigmatic bat hawk, and I think that's almost what we got to say. Uh, I don't know what timing we got left. Uh, here, I was going to say about raptors, Chris. I don't know if I can, if I want to stop here, but, but this is just a slide to talk about um, how raptors are increasingly getting endangered and how. The bat hawk is like a flagship species, one of these low felt specials, but all these other birds in the red data book, all the vultures are getting critically endangered, Batalia, Tawny, Marshall, Pell's fishing owl, you know, crown eagle, they all list southern banner snake eagle, pallid harrier migratory, um, which is a, a Dickinson's guest, or Taita falcon, there was a good talk there on the bird life webinars, but these are all secretary bird. They're all in the red data book and they're all getting very, very threatened. And it's all because of the last couple of years, the last 10 years. This is only going up to 2016. This is a slide from a paper, Conservation Ecology of African Raptors. And um, it shows you how raptors are really getting hammered. And um, the point is, is this bat talk, may, maybe it would be nice if this bat talk um, project maybe broadens out into, a, you know, maybe a, a broader, Raptor monitoring program, maybe with EWT and BirdLife South Africa, if they're not too territorial, can collaborate and maybe explore some other birds that getting more raptors, raptor files and people, citizen science people contributing to the knowledge base, which, which, which could be very interesting. And then just finally to talk about this fundraiser. So uh, Wessa Lowfelt uh, was the main supporter of this so far with, with Terry Pappas very kindly um, Terry Pappas very kindly bought this fantastic painting that that Ingrid Wiseby drew. I hope she's listening this evening, but um, Ingrid is an excellent uh, bird illustrated artist. She does a lot of the plates in, in, in Robert's Seven and, and Robert's Geographical Variation. It's a very, very detailed art. And um, she, Ingrid uh, did this very fantastic print for us for the Wild for the Battle project. And I've got so I've got the whole I've got, we've got about twenty prints uh, where the low faults up we've got them here and if people want to donate to this project we'll, we we can send you a, a signed print by Ingrid of these bat hawks just that's my number you are more than welcome to call me and we're selling them in a thousand and a print or like what that fifty five pounds or something and um, and uh, and that would go towards continuation of this battle cam project and and uh, I think we're going to we, this is just probably early days even we're going to get some really nice insights um, into into their biology and behavior and uh, this amazing bird that that the, the, the team of us in White River got together to monitor so 
And that's so that's acknowledgements. Wesley Lothar, Jeremy, Anderson, Terry Pappas, Karina for you is doing the social media, Ingrid Wiseby, Roy Sarkin, Peter Retief, Garth Bachelor, Bachelor, Stuart Matheson, Richard McKibben is a very uh, ornithologist who's been contributing information, Wimpy Nell, Mark Anderson from BirdLife South Africa, and Lou from WESA, the chairman of WESA Lothar. So so that's it, guys. Thanks for listening. And um, that's that's the talk. Hello, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to ask, I'm aware that some of the owls have special adaptations in their wings to muffle the sound so the mice don't hear them before they catch the prey. And I wanted to ask if these bird hawks have the same adaptations for the bats or something. Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I think I think that the the difference between the owls, the other owls. I mean, the barn owls can 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 uh, detect and catch a mouse on the floor, you know, from a from a from a distance, and they got this incredible ears where they synchronize the ears. They got on slightly different parts of their, their their head, and they and they work out they pinpoint exactly the distance of the um, of the prey. Um, I don't think it'll apply in bat walks because the Bats themselves, they don't hear the same way as um, mammals, as other mammals do, because they echolocating. So their sonar, they're so worried, as I say, they're so busy trying to catch the, the insect prey that they um, are probably oblivious to the battle. So they never issue arms race. They actually, uh, they're so worried, they're so honed in on going for their bat or for the insects that they don't even notice the battle. So the battle has worked out with their brilliant eyesight and the uh, aerodynamic wings to just hone in and get those bats. But the bats, they don't know what hit them. They're just flying and then they just they just get taken out. And, uh, so it's a very good question. I think you're right. The owls of um, the owls do it. They, 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 and they've also their, their, their wings have got their you know, silences on their on their barbs. They've got this. Uh, yeah, so that's correct. Mm. Yeah, thanks for the question. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. from TUT. Yes. Uh, he's a, must be a very bright student. Hey, Rindani, <laughs> or are you one of the lecturers at TUT, Rindani? <laughs> no, I'm just a student, just a student. <laughs> well done, Rindani. We've got the professor there. <laughs> well, thanks, Rio. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you, Rendani. Um, then anyone else? Any questions? I'm going to move to uh, just for now. Uh, the Oh, Marty, your hands up. There we go. Marty, can you hear us? RL, thanks. Sorry, Marty, we can't hear you. Yo, you're breaking up. Mm -mm. I think, I think Mabule is, is a bit further in the sticks than Sanga Lodge. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, Marty, it's really bad outside. Marty, maybe. Marty, um, I think it's better if you if you ask your question in the chat. We can't hear a thing. Please. Sorry, Marty. Sorry, Marty. I can't hear you. The radio. I think the VH. Is that something wrong with the VHF on your on your aerial? Sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me? No, Marty. Sorry. Can you You're transmitting, but we're not receiving. Here we go. Okay, oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. that's better. Yeah. That's better. <laughs> Can you hear me? I'll try yes. to talk now. Great. Go. Uh, sorry, I don't know if you can hear me now. I did type no, in the chat. We, we, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. I was wanting to 
uh, and thanks. Um, we learned a lot. Uh, you mentioned the various birds that the bat hooks had caught as well. Yeah. What percentage of their catch is birds compared to bats? I didn't, I didn't pick that up. Oh. One lot goes struck by lightning. Yeah, um, Marty, um, good question. Uh, I think we, if, 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 we dedicate, if we study those pellets, we'd work it out. But I think in Roberts, they said something like, I think the birds are quite high. I think it, there's quite a lot. It's quite a high proportion. I think it's, um, I don't know the exact stat, but I think it's the birds come up quite a bit in their prey. So they don't only do bats. They, they're eating... I think, you know, palm swifts and lesser striped swallows and uh, barn swallows, you know, they, or those birds hunting in the open, I mean, they'll, they'll go for those just as much as I go for bats. And I think, um, you know, they also, they, often the swallows and the swifts come out in the dusk. So I think it would be good to actually quantify it properly, but I think quite, quite a high proportion. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Marty. Happy with that? Yeah, oh, no, thanks. I, I was really glad. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Cool, man. Thanks. Brilliant. Yes. Then I'm going to go to the chat section quickly. Fiona McLeod has a question. Uh, there were some bat hawks on the outskirts of Nelspreet some years back. They seem to have disappeared. Any idea why? Um, hi, Fiona. I hope you're well. Um, yeah, so we're not exactly sure about the densities in White River Nelspate because we think that there's we think there's maybe three or four pairs, but some of the records kind of overlap. So um, there's definitely a couple of pairs. Um, so the one in Nelspate would be different to the White River birds, I think. Uh, uh, we'd have, they don't, we don't really know the, the the movements of the juveniles, so. Um, but I reckon there's, you know, you looked at that map on the, the Red Data Book map um, that, that BirdLife did. Um, you know, I think that they're, they're going to occur all along Nelspate to the Crocodile River. And uh, so I reckon there's a good couple of pairs. I don't know, I don't know how many exactly, but um, I think if you scouted Nelspate, maybe the Botanical Gardens or somewhere close to the rivers would, would probably find bat hawks there. I know in Malilan I've seen them there, and I think Lou's seen them in Marlow Park and stuff. So there's definitely quite a few. They're probably more common than we think, actually. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. There's a few people in the Andy Cleases. Um, he saw bat hawks in action in uh, Gunong Mulu National Park in Sharawak 26 years ago. Very good memory there, Andy. And Marie Hemp is uh, saying that uh, they had a breeding pair of bat hawks in their garden in Kigali in Rwanda in 2013. So it's all over the place. Hi. Lovely. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? I'd like to come in with a comment. Um, there we go. Ron, um, Rail, I'm glad you brought in a lot of Tony's work from from um, uh, Cliff, uh, Agatha and the Red Cliff sites there. Tam sitting next to me at the time was very happy too because she was very involved in that. Um, yes, but um, when you go to breeding, um, when, when we, what we at the Transform Museum, when Tony was doing all that work, it, it, it comes down to actually the the availability of suitable sites so if you've got a good tree that's in an area that the bat hawk's going to feel safe in uh with the right aspect they're going to breed in it which is obviously what happened in 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 null spray back in the day and 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 agatha and, and uh, red cliff and and your site in white river um and it's finding those good trees um they have to be pale bark trees with 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 horizontal branches that the bat hawks can see, and they have to be at a certain have a certain aspect, and it's all very interesting. Um, I don't know what to, if you'd like to comment on that, Rail. Yeah, thanks, Rod. Yeah, I mean, I, actually, I, I was a student at Vitz at the time. A friend of mine, Andrew Pringle, was working. He, he volunteered with Tony Harris, and he actually said that um, they actually the ones in Mahubas Kruf and Sanin they. They, they managed to get more information from those. Firstly, they managed to ring one, right? They put a misnet. I mean, apparently, they, they, they managed to ring uh, 
uh, some of those births, so it was easier for them to monitor the, them closely because they could differentiate sexual dimorphism just from just looking at the ring on their foot. So um, they, that's why they managed to get all that interesting data on incubation and um, the comparisons between the male and the female roles. Um, it's, we, we, we might, we, for our study, um, we would be ideal to, to catch them, but um, yeah, like you say, also they're very uh, site specific and they very specialized in the in the type of uh, locality on the branch. They're very specialized to uh, nesting sites. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'd like to just, I, I think it's a very good baseline paper that uh, it was Tony Harris, uh, Alan Kemp, and Dunning, I think you might know it. And it was published in a Glenn Glenn Dunning, yeah. Prey thing. Yeah, so. Um, uh, it'd be nice to if we if the, if our if our birds do raise a chick this season, we could it could really be a nice study because then we can actually replicate it closely and then um, and uh, and the technology we've got is actually the technology has gone on from twenty years ago. I mean they were really dedicated that study. They they looked at every single you know movement of those birds. I mean they they were camping underneath the tree for. For weeks and they were in their car in the look sounded like they were in their trailer of the car and they were just sitting there for for days and 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 uh we got the luxury that we got laptops and we could just monitor them from a laptop so it'd be very interesting to compare it more closely with that study and maybe can you maybe proofread it <laughs> <laughs> no i'm not i'm not uh I, tam might be interested because because she was heavily involved in that study but i i'm just very pleased to see the work carrying on you know and uh, it's a good legacy because, yeah, as, as you know, people may not know, but Tony was a very good friend of Tam and myself, and uh, he passed away several years ago um, in a car accident, way too young because he was he was younger than I am. But I'm um, sorry yeah. to hear that I didn't meet him. Sorry, sorry to hear that, but yeah, um, but it's it's a it's a very interesting um, it's very interesting to see the work carrying on. Um, have you have you been to see the nests at Agatha and Redcliffs? Are they still around? Are they still active? I think the one is. I've seen birders report on it every now and then. The, 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 I got a report from David Litswalo, who's a, a community guy. Exactly. Yeah. He really, really clued up uh, Shangan guy who um, uh, who studies uh, who's been monitoring that. That and, uh, yeah, they they put it on a platform. They put on a a, pl a platform to encourage the birds to breed. So they, they've got up there and they've actually, um, because they nest so precariously, as you know, so, you know, that's why you know, a big gust of wind can mess up their nest. So they put a, like a briar grid, like a platform up in a, I think it's also eucalyptus or um, I'm not sure what type of tree. I haven't seen the nest yeah, it is. myself, but, but David Litswala is monitoring them closely. So that he's with bird life. Yeah. Yeah. One of those community guide programs, yeah. So yeah. he's doing great. Oh, I know David very well. He's a good guy. He's a really, really great guy. And a good and a good guy. Yeah. Okay, James. Thanks. Um, just want to mention that Ruan, unfortunately, have to leave. Um, he's with uh, the Homebrew Film Company, and they have a bit of an issue on one of the uh, in one of the studios, and he had to leave. So apologies for that. Golf Bachelor, your hand is raised. Um, if you would like to come in and uh, <laughs> share with us, please, Golf. Yeah, I'd just like to comment on the bat hawk nests around Nullspread. Uh, we've had two nests that were unsuccessful. Uh, one bred for two years in a row, and the other one only managed to lay eggs. They were both in, in eucalyptus. Unfortunately, fire went through both the uh, one was in a plantation and one was a solitary tree. And, but both trees were burnt down and the, that was the end of that breeding attempt or both breeding attempts. Um, there's another nest that we are aware of. And this is in a, a caravan site with a lot of human activity. It's surprising that they even built a nest there, but they, they aborted their breeding attempt, probably due to disturbance. Thanks. Real. 
Thanks, yeah, I think that was Fiona McLeod's question. So I think Fiona, did that answer your question? Just want to see if we... uh, she asked a question in chat, so she will yeah. have to answer it. Right. Yeah. But thanks, okay. thanks, Garth. Yeah, I mean, you that you know the Nell Spade birds better. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, it's really nice too. So that in terms of this, you know, they call it a population viability. It would be nice just to get a a, a good idea about their densities uh, in in South Africa. Thanks, Real. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy Anderson coming in, please, Jeremy. No, uh, the, 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 the white river pair have moved there several times, you know, and, and usually, uh, well, they've probably been more unsuccessful reading attempts than successful attempts because of the nest being blown down. Um, Roy Sarkin did put, uh, put a bry grid up after the very first nest site uh, where the nest was blown down once. He put up a bry grid and then working for water came and took the tree out, you know. So, um, it hasn't been, it, the, the, this pair hasn't been very successful at all. And I was, we were, were quite surprised when a, when this egg didn't hatch last year that it, there was still lots of time, but they still didn't breed again, you know, so they didn't relay a nest. So they seem to just have one attempt and if it's unsuccessful, they don't try again. Interesting. Yeah, we're cautiously optimistic that they're gonna um, raise a chick this season. I, I think, uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, cautious optimism, but it'd be fantastic if they do, and um, and then we'll really be able to get some interesting uh, information data from the study. Yeah, so so holding thumbs. So I think just another thing which we need to do is we need to, from some of the costs, we need to look and see if we can find uh, insecticides in the cost because Garth raised the point that when this egg didn't hatch. Um, he raised the point that it might be uh, insecticides and that we don't know. So, and then the egg just disappeared, you know, so after it was about a week overdue, it just disappeared. Mm. Good, thank you. Quentin Kutsia. Thank you. I was just intrigued about, um, um, Rael showed, showed um, some data about the actual food items that they take. He recorded about 10 bats, but but I also heard that the, the bat hooks are crepuscular and not many of the bats are crepuscular. So um, I was just intrigued, for example, Schlieffen's bat is the first bat that you'll see. It's out early in the evening and I would have thought, is there a specific range within these bats uh, which, which would be more crepuscular bats because not all of them are. Um, and surely they would miss those then that are arboreal, that are nocturnal. Yeah, thanks, Quentin. That would make a really nice, uh, nice study. By the way, I don't know if you remember, I went to one of your great talks uh, once uh, at Sabi Sabi, where you spoke about the sycamore fig tree and the, and the symbiosis in the team building <laughs> in, in, in corporate society. You okay. won't remember me. <laughs> but uh, Quentin, yeah, it's a good idea. I mean, um, yeah, it'd be nice to look at a, you know, we, we, we could catch those bats with mist nets. I mean, I, I know the, the families, you know, you've got the fetal bats, the horseshoe bats, you've got slit face bats, uh, you've got the, um, the, the vespids. So I, I, I kind of know them down a family level, but I think when it gets to the specifics, the, 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 those data was from Robert. So those were, um, you know, there was that guy, Nas Rotenbach, Rod Martin, remember Nas Rotenbach, who did a study up in Pafuri where he was catching bats. And, and I think they're very difficult to identify in the hand. I mean, they're very specialized, but it could be quite a fun and, and worthwhile project to actually start catching the bats and maybe even putting bat detectors on them. And then you have like an inflorescence where you can actually maybe choose different bats from different families, put different inflorescence tags on them and actually maybe see, I think it's also got a lot to do with the levels. So the point with the, with the, um, the fetal bats and those horseshoe bats is that they, the fetal bats are in the open and the horseshoe bats are closer to the trees. But I mean, it's quite, it's, it's quite a super, you know, as I say, I, I don't, I'm not a, a bat expert, but I think it'll be a very interesting study to, to hone in and actually try understand their time, you know, what, 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 what time of the evening they're coming out and what time of the evening 
So it, it'd be nice to, yeah, as, I said, as, as you saw on the data, I think four o'clock and uh, seven, four o'clock in the morning and seven o'clock at night is when they're going to be catching the bats. That, that was in Mahubus Griffiths, and I'm not sure about our birds. Yeah, you see, that's make for a very interesting a crepuscular study. window. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be, it'd be very interesting to, to work out in our area. Um, but they, they bite her. It's not nice taking them out of a mist nest. So I'm not sure if well, I want to do it myself. Well, that was my <laughs> next question. I wonder if you could walk me through, because I really, I'm trying to envisage this. How, when that thing grabs a bat, right? How, what, yeah. How's it grab, how's it, it's got this wide gate. Is it just, um, is it, is it actually ripping it on the wing? Is it swallowing it whole and live? Is the bat struggling mm -hmm. in the so-called crop? How, how does this work? Yeah, I mean, they've got this, they've got this like very specialized adapted middle toe where it's got a claw. And what it sounds like they actually hook them. So, so they, they, they hone in and then they hook them and then that the, the talon, the, the claw, the elongated claw, and then and then they they ingest them in six seconds. So they they they've got them, and then they just they munch them. And they, as I was, in one of those slides, eighteen minutes, they'll eat seven bats. So they're just like going on a feeding binge, and then they're just quiet for the rest of the evening. So so they're killing them on the wing before actually ingesting them. I think they're eating them alive. Maybe. But I've got visions of this thing. Kicking and struggling. Yeah. yeah. Maybe they've got a <laughs> very strong gizzard. The Batwalks must have a very strong gizzard because as they engulfing them, they're probably still twitching inside their because, stomachs. Because now, you, now you're telling me there's six or eight of them in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, Quentin, nice you question. must keep on fantasize about that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks, it's Quentin. an interesting one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, and thanks for your questions and coming in, putting you back on mute. And Gibson, I'm going to ask you on mute and come in. And then I just wanted to say tongue in cheek, uh, uh, Quentin, you know why they hunt between six and seven? So that they on time, seven o'clock for the unlocking nature talk. So <laughs> you should put a little monitor out there. And Gibson, please come in. Hi, hello. Um, I was very interested. Somebody mentioned that they have been seen in Myles Park, and I doubt whether there are many eucalypts there. Are there other trees that you've seen them nesting in? Yeah, yeah thanks it's for the question. I, um, because I am going up to Myles Park next week, and uh, it would be something to perhaps hopefully see. Yeah, I, th I think the best chance of seeing them would be, um, I know they, they use sycamore fig trees, but they when they go foraging, they um, if you go out like at dusk or at dawn, and you just look above the the river, uh, the Crocodile River, um, your best chance is just go to you know go on a viewing deck or or, ne or just sit next to the there's no hippos sit next to the river, and just wait, and then it it, it, it looks your the silhouette it just looks like a large falcon, it looks like a it's this aerodynamic falcon. So you can mistake it for things like African goshawk or hobby falcon, but they got this real distinctive, like jerseys, just like this, this, this black uh, silhouette. Uh, and, you'll, and, and, and if you see it at dawn or dusk, it could well be a battle. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Lou, we've kept you for last. <laughs> sorry, sorry, uh, you have to unmute again, please, Lou. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, in Myleth Park uh, Rail, I would I would suggest your best chance would be the sycamore figs um, along the river frontage. Even though we had that massive uh, flood in 2000, we still have some pretty um, s substantial sycamores in the region, um, as one would expect. You know, when I when, often when I do my work, I refer to the MTPA uh, conservation um, important database for various taxa. And what really surprises me often is I might be working in a, a relatively forested area, a station. So it's all massive human, you know, and anthropogenetic um, activity. And then when I look at the lists, those conservation important lists, particularly for the birds, very often the bat hawk is listed as having been present there. 
Uh, so even with these forestry areas of ours, these these um, um, alien for, forestry areas, you, you find you find these the bat hawks, and I, um, I don't often see them, but we're always looking for them when we do do the work. However, I was I was just thinking, you know, it would be interesting to see what what um, differences there would be. I make a comparison between the breeding success of bat hawks in a normal natural environment as opposed to a uh, human environment like we are busy working in, because I'm pretty sure that, well, I think I might, I, it might be possible that this, this, the low success in the human areas is simply due to the stress. There's a, there's a huge lot of stressors involved. So mm -hmm. I don't know if there's yeah. any information available to make that comparison, because I'm not so sure about that. So do you know of any, any comparisons that one could potentially make in that regard? Yeah, Leo, it's a good idea. I mean, maybe, you know, it'd be nice to identify, you know, in general, you know, which which um, biodiversity, which species are, are more tolerant of, of you know, human-induced anthropocentric pressures than, than others. And you'd probably find, you know, that, you know, in terms of conservation planning, I mean, the, the, rea the reality is that these natural habitats are getting fragmented all the time. So if one's working on impact assessments, and looking at human impacts, you know, you want to know whether you how to manage those, you know, patches of natural bush and indigenous bush, and and have like um, corridors or stepping stones. I think with the battles, uh, the rivers are key. So I think the yeah. they occur in this yeah. riparian river region. So as long as the river, the riparian uh, habitat is nearby, maybe. That's why they're still viable in some of those impacted areas, agricultural areas or mining areas, that they're still foraging because they've got quite big home ranges. But then they're probably going back to the river to roost and to nest. But then, I mean, our birds, as you know, like is a eucalyptus tree. So, I mean, that's, a, that's an Australian tree. So, so they are quite tolerant. And I think they're more, you know, they're alchemists. They, 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 they're these really brave uh, Little birds, you know, raptors, and and I think they they're quite resilient. They're more more resilient than we think. So I think we think, oh well, bat hawks are so endangered and rare. I mean, they are endangered in South Africa, but I think they're actually quite plucky and they're tolerant to human pressures. Actually, they, I think, yeah, I think they. But it would be nice to think about that and how some bird, some animals are more tolerant to our disturbances than others. Yeah, 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 definitely. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, uh, Lou. Um, just two uh, things in the chat. Uh, Fiona came back and she thanked you that you answered a question. And then a question from Peter Ma Ma Makusha. He said, unfortunately, he missed some of the talk. He just wanted to know when the nesting period are again, if you can just go through that, Raoul. The nesting period? Yes, that was his question. Um, I think it's mainly October to November. So, um, I mean, October to December. So they're nesting now. So, um, so that's why we're hoping that they're going to actually raise a chick soon. So they, the incubation, I think, is 51 to 53 days. And we saw them copulating last week. So we can think about uh, October, November. Early November, we're hoping there'll be a chick. And if, if we don't have another lightning strike or if those Egyptian geese don't chase them away again, then we, I think we might have a chick, uh, the, the Batalks might have a chick um, in November, December. So we'll keep you posted. If you're interested, um, Karina Phil Yun has, has, has got a Batalk website where she posts updates on the progress of the birds. And um, so all the, 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 the footage that we download from the laptop um, we, you know, we send the best ones to Karina, and then she'll keep track. You can keep track on the battle on the website how they're doing on their breeding. So they're breeding now, basically. They're nesting now. Thank you very much, Rail. Um, just want to check. Um, uh, anybody? Uh, anything else? Any questions? I wanted to also check if Michael Mills is in, but I'm not seeing Rail. I thought he would be in, but it doesn't look like it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Well, okay, Marit, you can uh, unmute everybody or uh, do it in a way that everybody can unmute themselves. So 
The formal questions and answers are over now, Riel, and this is now friends and family period where anybody who would, wants to come in and say hi to anybody else or ask other questions or make some comments, you are welcome to do so. And before we do that, uh, also yet again to Rel and the incredible team for this incredible work you are doing. And do consider to also support them, uh, uh, them financially. And also remember about that uh, uh, signed uh, painting that uh, you can um, that you can get by doing a donation. Did you have, I think you mentioned the amount, which would be a, f a fair amount, Rel, also for the value of that uh, print? What would it um, be like in... Chris, we, we punted them on the bird life auction uh, between a thousand rand a print we did at, 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 the, at the bird life auction. So 900 rand, a thousand rand. I mean, it's uh, the main expense would just be to keep that camera functional and going. So at the moment we find it'll be great if people would support the project. Wonderful. And it is an incredible project and uh, well done to all of you. All right, anybody who would like to make any further comment also want to check if Marty Jasper is still hunting for a leopard for us tonight and to show us his leopard, you're welcome to try to come in, Marty. Uh, it was fascinating with you always on the talk and tonight you are doing a night drive and then suddenly we're sharing at a total different level. Uh, open to anyone, you are welcome just to unmute yourself and, and then uh, say hi or make your comments. Uh, sorry, may I say something, Chris? You're welcome, uh, Lua. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, rail. The other thing that one would be looking at possibly too is the 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 um, the bat population in our immediate area in White River, for example. I mean that you know, I'm sure the bats are also been affected by the various anthropogenetic um, um, activities, and you know, with respect to the change from forestry or afforested areas to macadamia farming, you know, we go from one agricultural practice that has uh, negative impacts to another with different negative impacts. And, uh, uh, you know, so it would be interesting to, to see how the bat population itself has also been affected because we've got insecticidal spraying um, on a much larger scale in our immediate area than we've had before. I, I was on the Water Research Commission's three-day symposium over the last three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. It's an annual symposium that the Water Research Commission have. And there were some very interesting talks on insecticides, insecticidal uh, spraying, and also the effects. And I know more about insect, insecticides now after having been on the symposium for the last three days. Um, so, yeah, you know, we would have to look at insecticides as well. And obviously, as you've said, too, it would affect the, the breeding success. Yeah, so, yeah, that sounds like an interesting proposal. I mean, yeah, I, mean I, I mean, I suppose one, uh, it's much easier to get species lists of birds because, I mean, you've got the Aptis project and you can, uh, you know, just, just get the locality, yeah, okay. the degrees, quarter degree squares with, with bats. I think they're very, you know, I think they're so more difficult to to monitor, but it could be a very interesting project. I mean, I, I, you know, um, I can get mist nets. We can try. We can try. Maybe it's worth a go. We can actually put mist nets up by the by the by the where they were breeding last year. Remember that? Where yeah, the, yeah, the vegetable yeah, gardeners. Yeah, yeah I think put the up is... and actually get some bats. Yeah, no, true. I think the only problem is we won't be able to quantify it too well. So we won't really know mm -hmm. what, what it's like you know, from the quantification uh, point of view. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah it's a good question. Lou, I mean, it's, we, 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 uh, I mean, in White River, since I've been here, you know, there's been so much development just along that river and everything. I just, I don't know, it's, a, it's quite relentless. There's macadamia plantations, uh, the, you know, the timber. It's, it's quite sad. And I think, you know, what it's nice just to, I don't know how tolerant bats are, but you go to the Sabi River and it's quite refreshing to see hundreds and hundreds of bats coming out yeah. during the night. Yeah. Real, um, Andre de Georgius had a question in chat. Andre, you want to come in and ask your question instead of me just reading it from the chat? Maybe at this point, it's a good point to come in, please. No, I was, I was just curious why the bats seem to be endangered, uh, not the bats, the birds, seem to be endangered in uh, South Africa, but are doing quite well everywhere else. 
Is it a combination of habitat? You mentioned you know, pesticides. South Africa is probably the most sophisticated country in Africa with regards to you know, modern day agricultural practices. So I assume that there must be a lot of linkages there. Why are they doing so poorly in South Africa and doing fine everywhere else? I think I think it could just be their natural mainly to do with their natural distribution. I think the the ones in South Africa we're just on the southern edge of their natural okay. distribution. So um, I think you know in in other countries, I mean they seem to you know from I mean that map we've got Zimbabwe, Botswana, Zambia, Malawi. No, they come to the west, you know, CAR and Congo, and they actually listed as they're actually not as rare there as they are in South Africa. So I think it's just a natural distribution. So, so they're really they're not endangered. They're not endangered. They're not critically, they're not endangered um, according to the IUCN red list, put it that way. Okay. 